distinguished speakers and guests, Mrs. Ko, fellows and students of Tembusu and other colleges, welcome. Animal conservation has been one of our themes since we were founded as a college in 2010. It began when students voted to name our five houses after endangered Asian animal species. Ponya for red panda, Tancho for red-breasted crane, Aura for Komodo dragon, Gaja for Asian elephant, and Shan for snow leopard. Now colleges and halls around the world often use animals as emblems, usually carnivores like lions and eagles, in order to build a competitive or aggressive spirit. But I was proud of our, that our students chose animals not as totems for human competitive instincts, but for their endangerment. As a reminder that we, as stewards of our planet, have a responsibility to them with whom we share it. Our house animals are not semi-mythical symbols of strength. They're real and vulnerable. And our students have, from the beginning until now, done things to address that vulnerability. In our first year, through Professor Coe's intervention, we were given two elephant statues to paint as part of the elephant parade project, which still stand just outside these windows as reminders of our commitment. Auctioned by Sotheby's, they raised over $50,000 to create pathways in India linking the habitats of wild elephants. That sense by students of wanting to do something has continued through our founding of the Tembusu Wildlife Association, our Rector's Shield Initiative, which raises awareness and funding for an animal of the year, our summer school course on animals in the city, which is, by the way, still taking sign-ups, and the many guests we've invited here to teas and symposiums from the conservation community. The question before us tonight, can we stop the mass extinction of species, is one I'll let the panelists deal with. But I should point out at the beginning that questions like that are not really meant to be answered so much as their calls to action. They're reminders of tough moral challenges. But this one differs in some respects from other big questions we've asked in past forums, such as will Japan and China go to war, or who should be the president of the United States? We've asked that twice. Those were pretty strictly exercises in self-education, because you, as Tembusu college students, you couldn't do much about either of those. And even I, who had a real vote, in the US presidential election, I couldn't do much to influence it myself, right? But tonight's question, as big and daunting as it is, it relates to a topic which we can, in a limited way, do something about. We are in the very heart of a region, Southeast Asia, where the problem is arguably most acute. But wherever we are, in whatever part of the globe, we can educate ourselves which is what tonight is all about, and then, in various ways, act on that knowledge. And preventing, while preventing mass extinction might be too daunting, helping to prevent the extinction of some species is a project actively occurring at NUS right now, and even at this college. And nothing said here tonight should deflect you from finding ways to help, if you're so inclined. One thing that spurred our original commitment as a college to this project was the example of our rector. You probably know, or at least ought to know, that Prof. Co. organized and guided the Earth Summit, which 25 years ago in Brazil put climate change on the global agenda. It's sometimes forgotten, though, that another fruit of that conference was the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. At the very same time the conference, this college was founded in 2010, Prof. Ko delivered the prestigious Linnaeus Lecture in Nagoya, Japan, where he said that the three major challenges facing the world were climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and desertification. He further said, to quote him, it's a pity the world has taken a rather unbalanced view of these challenges. Too much attention to climate change 
and too little to biodiversity. So to help us correct what he rightly described as an imbalance in our sense of planetary mission, let me invite Professor Koh to the podium tonight to introduce tonight's question and the distinguished panelist who will help him address it, Professor Koh. Thank, thank you very much, Greg, for that introduction. Um, my, my duty tonight is to introduce three good friends and to moderate the discussion later. Um, the first person I wish to introduce is Elaine Tan. Elaine is the Chief Executive Officer of WWF Singapore. As many of you will know, <clears throat> WWF is issues annually an authoritative living planet report which I read conscientiously. So let me not preempt what Elaine's going to say. Let me just say, Elaine, please come to the rostrum and, and share your knowledge with us. Elaine, please. Good evening, Professor Tommy Ko, my fellow speakers, Dr. Lina Chan, Professor Peter Ng, the wonderful students who are all here and guests. Tembusu Forum has established a very good reputation for creating very interesting and meaningful dialogues. And it is a real privilege for me to be here today. So let me start by saying that Singapore is among the world's most open, most globalized societies. And if you look at um, all of us around here, we are so well connected, we're so well traveled. And um, we mainly export a lot of developments from other parts of the world that impact our society and the way we make our choices in our lifestyles. However, when it comes to understanding how we impact the natural world, the connection is often less direct. Why? Because we have less access to natural resources and therefore feel a lot less connected to the natural environment. It is my pleasure to be here today to share with you what WWF sees as the sixth mass extinction. And most importantly, is to discuss how we in Singapore can be part of the global solution. What you see here is an illustration of how the world temperatures have changed from 1850, or what we call the pre-industrial age, to 2016. What this illustrates is the warming of the planet caused by increasing amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere driven primarily by the rise of fossil fuels and the role it has in driving industrial revolution and the modern world we all live in. Global warming is a reality. Today, we are almost at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. 2016 was the hottest year, and I'm sure many of us in Singaporeans can attest to that. If nothing is done, we are all on a path to a three to four degree world by 2030. Already as I'm speaking, we have lost five Pacific islands to rising sea levels. Extreme events, weather events have been taking place all over the world, including in Singapore. And as you know, you know recently the government has imposed a water price hike due to scarcity issues associated with climate change. The Earth's ecosystems have evolved over millions of years. These diverse ecosystems provide people with food, water, clean air, energy, medicine, and recreation. Over the past 100 years, our natural resources have come under increasing pressure due to the exponential growth of industries and the demand of a growing global population. Today, mankind requires the resources of 1.6 planets to provide the goods and services we use each year. This has inevitably led to a direct impact on our natural environment and the ability of the environment to regenerate to cater to human demands. Indeed, this is why issues like water, scarcity and food security are very integral in conversations at both the national level and at the global level. So what is it that puts a major pressure on our ecosystems and species? is mainly our food system and our energy systems. Activities such as the conversion of natural habitats to agriculture, overexploitation of fisheries, 
and unsustainable farming of fishing practices impact the ability of our natural ecosystems to replenish naturally. Let me share a little about the findings of our Living Planet Report, which we publish every two years. And this is a comprehensive study of the trends of global biodiversity and the health of the planet. One of the key measures of the report is the Living Planet Index. And it's provided by the Zoological Society of London, which measures the state of the world's biodiversity and tells us how species are faring. Simply put, the LPI can be compared to a stock market index, except that instead of monitoring the global economy, it is an important indicator of the state of the world's biodiversity. What does the LPR cover? It covers biodiversity of our natural world, such as fish, birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. In total, the LPR monitors 14,000 populations of some 3,700 vertebrate species in our world today. We recently published the latest LPR in the late 2016. And it was also the first time that WWF is projecting what our natural world will look like in the near future. The findings were rather shocking. The science shows that from 1970 to 2012, there was a 58% overall decline in vertebrate population sizes. In other words, biodiversity of species with a backbone have on average dropped by more than half in about 40 years. This is an average decline of 2%. And there is no sign that there's any way in which the populations are going to improve in terms of their status. If this downward trend persists, we predict that species populations could decline by an average of 67% by 2020. What are the four biggest drivers of the loss of species? Habitat loss and degradation, species overexploitation, pollution, and climate change. Let me speak a little bit about the first two drivers habitat loss and degradation and species overexploitation. Food production to meet the demands of mankind is the primary source behind the top two causes of species loss, the destruction of habitats and the overexploitation of wildlife. Agriculture occupies one third of the Earth's land area and accounts for almost 70% of water use. A primary example of overexploitation of species is our oceans, where up to 90% of fish populations are already fully exploited. The prediction is that in 30 years' time, I'm not so sure whether it's going to be within my lifetime, but it's definitely going to be within yours, we will see a collapse of global fish stocks. Species overexploitation. There is a thriving illegal wildlife trade globally. It is worth an estimated US 20 billion annually, and it is driving the poaching of wildlife species for ivory, rhino horn, tiger parts, and others. Thirdly, the third driver would be pollution. Pollution of our land or water destroys wildlife habitats. Fourth is climate change. Climate change drives fish species away from warm waters into colder waters, which means it's a lot harder for fishermen to be out there catching fish, whether for their livelihoods or for commercial reasons. Rising sea levels not only affect coastal communities, it also eliminates the mangrove habitat of tigers in Bangladesh, for example. Recent studies show that we may be entering a sixth mass extinction. In the past, such major extinction events took place over hundreds and thousands and even millions of years. Today, it is happening within a single human lifetime. Why? Simply for the first time, humans are the single biggest force altering the state of our planet. So the planet seems to be entering a new geological epoch, which is known as the Anthropocene which is marked by what a single species, us humans, 
has done and can do to the planet. Thousands of years later, this period will be as significant as meteorite strikes and volcano eruptions that mark past geological eras. Only difference in this era is that what will be left on the Earth's rock strata would be the impacts of human activity, from megacities to, shockingly, plastic waste. So the 21st century presents to humanity with a dual challenge. How do we maintain nature and its services and be able to also create an equitable home for people on the planet with limited resources? Protecting the environment alongside economic and social development requires a system change. We need to shift from short-term decision-making to adopting a long-term intergenerational vision. It has, nothing, it has less to do with limiting the growth of human population and has everything to do with reforming our food and energy systems in order to be able to draw on the resources of our natural world sustainably. In WWF, across our global network of 6,000 staff in over, in over 100 countries, we focus on six major goals, which are forests, oceans, wildlife, food, climate and energy, and water. And cutting across the, three, the six goals are three drivers to address the environmental problems. Markets, sustainable finance, and governance. In Singapore, we focus on four key areas where we see the most pressing conservation needs. Forests, oceans, wildlife, and climate change. In line with the needs of the planet, WWF has two meta goals, one of which is by 2050, the integrity of the most outstanding natural places on Earth is conserved, contributing to a more secure and sustainable future for all. Secondly, by 2050, humanity's global footprint stays within the Earth's capacity to sustain life and the natural resources of our planet are shared equitably. Let me end with um, a video that we put together just to show how important it is for all of us and not just policy makers, not just governments, not just civil society, but every single individual. Um, the ambition and, and, and the aspiration that doing coming together can make a lot of things possible and that includes turning the tide of the planet's decline. So even though our goals are ambitious and the environment challenges, environmental challenges are daunting, no one person or group can tackle this on our, on our own. But if we work together, we can take on anything. At WWF, WWF Together Possible embodies the way we work, in unity with people, partners, and institutions to achieve lasting conservation outcomes.
Uh, thank you, Elaine, for that presentation. Um, the next speaker is somebody um, who is very close to, to me, um, Professor Peter Ng. He's a world-class marine biologist. Um, he's a world authority on crabs. Not chili crabs and black pepper crabs, <laughs> but, but uh, mostly inedible crabs, I think. No? Crabs both found in fresh water and also found in, in the sea. And, and when, whenever you travel with Peter, you must expect him to bring, that he will find the time to go looking for crabs. And I had that experience with him a few years ago when we were in Jamaica. Um, Peter is also a very good teacher and has, has inspired uh, many young people, not just in Singapore, but in the ASEAN country, to, to train for the PhD in, um, in marine biology. Um, he's not only a thought leader, but also a man of action. So a few years ago, when I suggested uh, to him that NUS should build a Museum of Natural History to house our reference collection, um, he and his collaborator, Professor Liu Tan, uh, accepted my exhortation. And in a very short period of time, they raised a very significant amount of money and built this beautiful Natural History Museum, the Lee Kong Chen uh, Natural History Museum. I'm very proud of Peter, and it's a great pleasure to invite Peter to share his thoughts with us. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Prof Ko has been kind. Um, when he extolled NUS, and all my colleagues to build a natural history museum. It was a very persuasive, you ain't got a choice, but you got to do it, <laughs> all right? And he made that request. When it first started, we were in the middle of the last financial depression, right? But the theme is actually correct because uh, it's about failure and success. So today, when Prof Ko asked me to give a talk, all right, how can I say no? Um, my job, and he has chosen three different speakers with three different temperaments. First thing I'll tell you, I'm a professor in NUS, I'm a biologist, I'm a pessimist, and I'm a hypocrite. Because today I'm going to talk about three things. I will emulate Prof Ko. He always talks about three things, okay? So I was challenged to talk about three things today. <laughs> today I'll talk about three things without slides, all right, to see whether I can be a good, uh, you know, Avatar for you. First thing, being a hypocrite. I run a natural history museum. And what does a natural history museum do? I kill for a living. I kill specimens, I kill animals, so that my biologists, my scientists can study them. Because I need the dead body in front of me so I can examine them, decide what they are, what it is, what species they belong to, and study it, report on it. One of the first things I've learned in a long career here is that when you want to practice conservation, when you want to conserve different species of plants, animals, even ecosystems, you need to know what you're conserving. You cannot conserve what you do not know. It's very important. And for people in the Natural History Museum, our job is to help identify, work out what are the species that are present out there. And it's an awfully difficult job. We have 1.8 million plants and animals that have scientific names. What it means, scientists know what they are. We know, we give them a name. To do that, very often, we have to do not so nice things to the animals. My scientists use a very polite word. We immortalize them for science. <laughs> but we are up against a huge challenge because the number of species out there is over five, eight, ten million, all right? We have 1.8 million named. We are up against a headwind that we will probably lose because we are losing forests and reefs and systems faster than we can name the animals, faster than we can find the animals. But we try because looking for animals is fun. But I make no pretense that one of the essential core to what I do is I need to go out, look for strange, interesting plants and animals, and do not very nice things to them. 
by the process, through the process, I then tell you this is species X, species Y. Some of them are endemic. Some of them are endangered. Some of them are of great conservation importance. Then another group of people, the conservation people, takes over to ensure that these species, which have been discovered, stay around for as long as possible. I've been called many things. The most common word is bastard, killer, murderer, and all these things. All right? But I make no apologies for that. All right? Because in the particular business I'm in to document biodiversity, I have to do not very nice things. Like a soldier. There's a very nice grave in, uh, in Som, in the place where there was a very bad battle in the First World War. One gravestone says this, for all soldiers, the motto of all soldiers, some must die so that others may live. The animals that we kill, we hope, will further the cause of conservation. Is it justifiable? Probably not. <laughs> Is it necessary? Probably yes. So I'm a hypocrite. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what are we? So now we talk about species. Now we talk about mass extinctions. Since I look for species, are extinctions of a great concern? Yes, they are of great concern. As the first speaker has suggested, this may be the sixth major extinction for which we have documentation. Scientists in 82, 1982 said there were five major extinction events that have been documented in the fossil record. Five big kill-offs. The one that all of you know, and probably the one you know the best, is the one that got us here. 65 million years ago, something fell out of the skies. Crashed into the earth and killed off a whole bunch of large animals called dinosaurs. Well, as a purist, biologist, I can tell you dinosaurs actually did not become extinct because a few dinosaurs survived and you call them chickens. Birds are direct descendants of dinosaurs, but the big ones died off. That major extinction event from 65 million years ago was very important. It wiped out 70-80% 70, of all life on Earth. All the major animals, all the big dinosaurs, kaput. It allowed the whole slate to start again. And we are the benefactors of that extinction. 200 million years ago, another major extinction took place. Again, 70-80% of all life got wiped out. Volcanic activity, some believe. Climate change brought on by non-human events. Okay? And 250 million years ago, what they call the granddaddy of extinctions, that killed off, some people estimate, 90%, 95% of all life on Earth. Now, that is a big one. Why am I telling you all this? Because through all these five major extinction events, what happened was change. Life came back in full force. Even after a 95% extinction event, life came back in full force. Of course, a bit slower, lah, but it came back. The last extinction event 65 million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs was not fatal. The question I ask all of you to think about is this. Are we going through an Anthropocene extinction? WWF and IUCN all estimate all right, if current trends continue, we are going to have 50-60% die-offs of all the major plants and animals. My question to all of you is, so what if it happens? Now, of course, I need to ask that question because most people like to talk about nice things. What are nice things? We will find a way. We will solve it. I have great faith that humankind will come together at the last minute. I'm a pessimist. I have very little faith in humankind. Prof. Ko put me as a second speaker because I'm a pessimist. <laughs> My job is to depress you, all right? If all or most of the life forms get killed off because of our stupid activities, if, what will happen to the earth? New life forms will come over. New life forms will take over. How will they affect human beings? Ah, that's a more interesting question. If we allow 60, 70, 80 percent of the life forms on Earth to die out, all right, it also means that we are screwing up the planet in a grand way. 
And it means that the life that you lead, the comfortable life you lead, be it air-conditioned rooms, be it clean water, be it nice food, all will have very terrible consequences. If you let 60 to 70 percent of the life forms die off, just imagine what your planet will look like. And imagine the planet you have to live in. The chief, the one who suffers the most, will be us. The question that I think you must ask is, your children's fate will be in very uncertain terms. <laughs> Humankind will go through all sorts of challenges. Don't worry about the animals. And after all human beings become extinct because of something stupid we do. And we have a habit of doing stupid things, I don't have to tell you that. People always say, all these climate change problems, all these extinction problems, the earth will end. No, life will go on. The planet will continue. It's just that we may not be around. <laughs> There'll be new life forms based on insects or crabs <laughs> or rats. They will survive. They will diversify. There'll be a new ecosystem, a huge number of species based on these things. But life will go on. So this is my second point. All this bruaha by extinctions, it has happened before and it will happen again. This time, unfortunately, we are responsible. If we fail to reverse it, we are going to suffer. Don't worry about the animals, all right? Worry about your children. That's more immediate. My third point, if I'm so pessimistic about human beings, usually when Prof Ko asks me, Peter, anything can be done, I say, nope. This term, homo sapiens, sapiens is a lost cause for us, all right? We have a habit of repeating our mistakes. I always tell him I'm a pessimist. And then people will say, if you are a pessimist, then why are you advocating conservation? Why are you studying all these kinds of animals, all these species, if you know they're all going to die anyway? Why do you work with the conservation people if you know that this is a lost cause? Right? Well, firstly, I'm not very smart. Okay? I'll admit to you. If I'm smart, I would have pulled out of this. But... The reason why I continue is very simple. I like being a pessimist, and some of you I can convert you tonight. An optimist is very sad when he's wrong, when things go wrong. A pessimist is very happy when his predictions are wrong. All right? If I'm right, I'll tell you I told you so. If I'm wrong, I'm cheering. Think about it. My stupidity from still advocating conservation, the study of biodiversity, and doing everything we can comes out of stupidity. But stupidity, in my context, is a very important human value. We want to conserve all these animals, we want to protect the ecosystems. People will tell you because there's economic value, all right? They have ecosystem services. You heard all this before? Yeah, partly true. Here's a more important reason. Because it's the right thing to do. In your heart, you know it feels right. I cannot let this animal become extinct. It is morally irresponsible. It feels wrong. And human beings have always had this strength. When something feels wrong, we have to do something. Will I lose this battle to conserve, to turn back the clock of extinction? Probably. But I have the one very bad habit. I hate to lose. I'm going to fight. I'm going to try. Because if you don't try, you fail anyway. All right. The only reason why we have a natural history museum here at Prof Co's, you know, push is because all my colleagues who fought at the museum, some believe it could be done, some like me just don't like to fail. Everybody told us we will fail. In my heart, I said we'll probably fail. But what the hell, let's try. And guess what? I was wrong. <laughs> and I'm absolutely delighted about it. For conservation to succeed in the years ahead, for us to ensure that this sixth extinction doesn't become worse, all of you have an awful challenge, all right? How far are you willing to go to save those things? At the end of the day, you're not saving the animals for the animal's sake. You're saving them for your own sake. Change it around. I'll be dead by then. Good luck.
Peter is always inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he's a stupid pessimist. <laughs> um, the, the third speaker is also a very good friend, Dr. Lina Chan, who is the head of biodiversity at our National Parks Board. And uh, the National Parks Board is playing a very important role in the world. It's, it's championing the view that cities have a role to play in the conservation of biological diversity. That cities are not necessarily enemies of nature or enemies of biological diversity. And because of their leadership, the, the UN has adopted a Singapore Index for cities on biological diversity. A um, few years ago, uh, Lina and I were together at a major conference, Contracting Party in Nagoya, where I delivered the Linear's lecture. Um, I want Lina to come and speak to us to balance Peter's pessimism and to give us some positive news about what we can do collectively to fight against the mass extinction of the species. Um, tembusu. We have a very, very favorite, famous tembusu tree in the Singapore Botanic Gardens. And that connects us. I, and for you, maybe not you, but your parents probably spend their time uh, either sitting in the tembusu tree on the tembusu tree or, you know, dating. Uh, that's probably how your parents met, you know, and make babies like you. So anyway, the tembusu tree is now in, um, uh, uh, still in the uh, uh, Botanic Gardens. And um, just one more note, um, the lots of names that um, we call Peter, I like to call him the pickler. And we keep him away from the nature reserves because he then collects specimens and pickle them. So anyway, yeah. Okay. Um, you can start timing now. <laughs> okay, can we stop the mass extinction of species? No. If they are not anthropogenic. An emphatic yes. If it is if the causes are anthropogenic. So, what are some of the causes? Population increase, climate change, urbanization, industrialization, agriculture, and other economic activities. So, if there are any of these, it is within our power to actually stop any mass extinction. I'm actually going to speak much more. Well, uh, Elaine spoke on the global level. Um, uh, Peter spoke on you know more personal level. I'm going to speak on what Singapore does because you are here in Singapore, and we are looking at what Singapore can do. And if Singapore can do it, any other city, any other country can do it. So we're just going to quickly look at some of the species diversity you have in Singapore. We are just a city, but we have 2,000 over plant species. We have um, more, you know, 392 bird species, quite formidable. And what I really want to bring is these points about um, dragonfly species, more than what uh, the UK has. Now, about a few years ago, maybe about four years ago or so, I, I always show this slide. And a few years ago, number of spider species, more than 200. Now, I can add and say they're more than 800. How come? Are they new species coming up? No, but it's just that we learn more about them. And, and we're not just talking about species. Uh, okay, somebody just found it. We have other means of actually uh, verifying it. For example, just quite, I mean, you all do interdisciplinary studies, right? So instead of just looking at the taxonomist, quite by chance, I met one person who works on air quality. And he was actually looking at air quality in, the, uh, in Bukatima. And what he said was that he was testing out 
the number of particles, of different kinds of particles, and he found the most number of spider particles in Bukit Tima Nature Reserve, which for me, I took it on, wow, that is another verification that because taxonomically, uh, our Spider-Man, who's also um, masquerading as a diplomat, um, <laughs> he, he actually uh, did find more and more species of spiders. Okay? And hard coral species, this, I have to tell you, is quite amazing. 255 hard coral species. There are 800 in the entire world. We have one third of the hard coral species in the world. And we're a busy pot. Lots of industry. Pulau Semakau, the, you know, uh, uh, you could say dustbin or, you know, waste center. And yet we have 250 five hard coral species. So five, 50 sea anemone species. Uh, Peter knows that Daphne Fontine, who is a world expert on sea anemone, actually said that we have more sea anemone species in Singapore than the entire coastline stretching from Vancouver, the western coastline of the uh, North America, right from Vancouver to Southern California. That's a long stretch, but we have more species in that stretch. So, just to give you some sense that even in a city like Singapore, we have very high species diversity. And besides that, we have a lot of ecosystems. The number of ecosystems, we have more than 10 ecosystems. And the reason why I'm bringing in ecosystem is it's very difficult to try and save every species in the world. Because you can imagine there are thousands and millions of species. How do you actually then save every species? So the best way to do it is actually save the habitats they're in. And if you save a diversity of habitats, you're bound to be able to save a lot of different types of organisms. So that's the strategy we are targeting, that we ensure in Singapore, we ensure that at least one, ecosystem, uh, one site of each ecosystem is legally protected. So that's, that's the way we try and conserve the diversity of species. So, and yet, again, as I said, besides the high number of species, we're still finding new species, new plants, just in 2015, just fortuitously, the year that we celebrated uh, Singapore's 50th birthday, we found a new species of ginger. And again, it's amazing considering that, you know, our botanists, and we have a long line of botanists, and yet we found a new species. And it's named after Singapore, yeah, Zingziba singaporensis. So it's amazing, and all these are new species of plants. New species of spiders. Um, no, 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 that, that kohai is actually uh, after Joseph. But we also am pleased to learn today that there is actually a um, stick insect. Stick insect named after Prof. Tommy Ko. I'm sure there are lots great. I'm sure there are lots of species named after Peter, right? Crabby things. Mostly crabby things. Yeah. Um, I, I'm glad that uh, Joseph also kindly named a uh, spider after me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we have lots, we still have lots of spiders. Yeah. And, and there are over. 150 new species of long-legged flies. And then we sort of wonder, within one year, Patrick Gruta, the lord of flies, actually uh, found several species of long-legged flies. And whenever I mention them, you know, in a, a, a meeting with the PERMSEC or, you know, somewhere up there, high up there, and they're sort of wondering, what kind of flies? Aren't flies for swapping? Then I say, no, because without these flies, you're going to have Singapore as a rubbish dump because they are the ones who break down um, all the um, uh, living organisms, dead organisms, and then they are the ones who clear the mess for us. So it's important. Every species you know, has a role to play in our you know, uh, uh, living 
planet or dead planet anyway. Yeah. And there's so many insects that have been described in the past year. We have phasmids, yeah, um, which are your stick insects. And we have um, uh, uh, autoptera, um, and, and also bees and uh, various kinds of uh, flies. As I said, more than 150 species of long-legged flies. So we keep finding new species, which means that there's hope. There's hope. And we keep um, also rediscovering species that we thought were dead, you know, extinct. So, and there are even many, many marine organisms. Um, we went through a comprehensive uh, marine biodiversity survey and uh, in partnership with not only NUS, but citizen science people. Lots and lots of young people joining us. Not only young people, but the young people then pulled their parents along. So now we see a lot of um, young people uh, dragging their parents along. So we've got converts now uh, that are parents. Some of them come to look after the kids who are not so young, but nonetheless. So, so we, we've been finding new species. So it's quite amazing. Okay? So now, what is Singapore doing to try and conserve our native biodiversity? What are we doing? So in the past years, We've been doing things rather ad hoc, but we've been doing things all this while. So we decided that we should actually sit down, put our heads together, come up with a nature conservation master plan. And so, like Prof, we then focus on four thrusts. Yeah? And the four thrusts are, number one, we have to conserve our native habitats. So conserving native habitats. And that... I would go um, a, a list down. Besides conserving your native habitats, we have to conserve our buffer areas. So those surrounding them. Like, for example, uh, how many of you actually go and um, go around our parks? Anyone? Not that many. Some of them go cycling on uh, mountain bikes, but nonetheless. But you have actually, we have lots of, besides the four nature reserves we have, which is Bukatima Nature Reserve, Central Catchment Nature Reserve, Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, and Labrador. We also have a lot of parks buffering our nature reserves, like Windsor Park, Chestnut, you know, Hindhead. Um, so a whole host of them, and there are more coming up. So it's important that we buffer it so that there is actually some breathing space between our real nature reserves and so-called, you know, outside world, you could say, yeah. So that's one, buffer areas. And two, very important, to expand the effective area that they can forage. We actually connect them. So connectivity is extremely, extremely important. So what we do is we have park connectors that connects park to parks, parks to, you know, uh, uh, nature reserves and, and literally whatever we can connect. So we try and connect, and we all use science to do it, which I'll talk to you a little bit about the applied research in science. Now then, face it, we live in a city. There's no turning back. Um, Peter wrote a, a, um, you know, an article once in Nature called you know, uh, Catastrophic Extinction of Species. And I told him that, well, uh, that was like, you know, many years ago that all this happened, 1930, we like to blame the British because they were the ones by 1930, most of our, you know, uh, pristine habitats were gone. So we're left with mm, some nice bits, but the not so, the degraded bits. What do we do with it? We're not going to sit and cry and say, oh, are the Brits, you know. So what we do is we then decide to actually um, enhance those habitats. And we also enrich those habitats and create them if we need to. So if you go along, we do that not only in our nature reserves, the, the reforestation, not only in our parks, but we also do it, if you open your eyes, we also do that along our roadside. So previously, our roads used to be very structured, very nice. 
single species, all very nicely, very neat, you know. Now, we can afford to actually have that element of naturalness. And if you, so open your eyes when you're either driving, or maybe not keep your eyes on the road, but anyway, um, or if you're on the bus, do look, and you find that they're multi-layered because we say we should emulate that of a forest. And with multi-layering, there are a number of advantages. Number one, you actually provide more habitats for different species because just like some of us living in high-rise, some of us, you know, in different kinds of housing, similarly, with species, it's the same. So we provide all sorts of different habitats. And the next important thing is we provide a wide range of species, which means that, again, that species diversity is actually extremely important. More so, quite in, unintentionally, we didn't realise that there are other benefits because to fight climate change, as you all notice now, it rains more heavily, the storms, the winds are stronger. So, when you have actually just rows of neatly, you know, even space trees, you get this wind tunnel effect. But with these trees that are all over the place, at different, they diffuse the wind power and therefore that reduces the wind power and, and that helps to actually uh, stop you know, trees from falling uh, as fast because of the higher wind speed. And it's also great for successional planning because if all the trees are of the same age, by the time they reach like 50, 60 years old, they start growing old and when they all fall, it's like a domino effect. But with these multiple species and different heights, then you find that there will always be something to actually uh, 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 move in. So that's the uh, habitat enhancement and species recovery. We work very hard to um, you know, look after the uh, little crab that's about this size, not chili crab, that um, uh, uh, Peter talks, you know, fights very hard for. That's the Johora singaporensis. Hey, we do it for you, so don't shake your head, right? Yes, so we, we actually saved that endemic crab and we worked very hard to save it, yeah. And, and there are lots of other species, like for example, it ranges, uh, for example, the banded, uh, uh, raffles banded langer and various, many other species that actually we work on, yeah. Um, and we use applied science research, yeah. So, for example, when we do this connectivity, we just don't randomly, um, you know, select uh, sites to join up, but we actually do uh, use maps and then look which is the path of least resistance. How do you connect? How do you best connect? And we use agent-based modelling to find out which are the areas of good biodiversity. Yep. So then that's applied research and planning. And the most important is we can't do it by ourselves. We need community stewardship. What's the point of doing conservation top-down when the rest of the community, the people, don't want it? So we feel that it's extremely important that people believe in it and want to do it, but they won't know how to do it or why they do it unless we outreach them. And whatever information we have, we then spread the word around. So that's why community stewardship is extremely important and outreach. And we then, uh, now we find that uh, schools, it's amazing, Commonwealth uh, Secondary School, they have their own wetlands in the school. And they do, they teach um, uh, 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 biodiversity in Chinese. The Chinese class is held in the wetlands, in the school. So it's, it's quite amazing. So please put in your mobile and mark that date. May 27th and 28th, we have the Festival of Biodiversity. Your first step, volunteering or supporting Festival of Biodiversity, Celebration of Biodiversity. So all come to next easy place, all right? Next. So, now I'm just showing you these, if we conserve these ecosystems, like rainforests, streams, right? If we conserve these habitats, and streams are one of the most endangered, I think, ecosystems in Singapore, and we are fighting very hard to keep them. Then, you're going to see the otters. 
At one time, we were thinking, how do we bring back the otters? How do we actually do species recovery? Now we realize that if you have clean rivers, clean water drainage system, you can have otters. You can see them now in Marina Bay, Angmokyo, Bishan, uh, Pongo, you know, everywhere. Have any one of you seen these otters around? Yeah, you see them, right? And it's such a joy because, uh, but please don't get too near and don't touch them. Just, you know, watch them from afar, okay? And hornbills. At one time, the hornbills were extinct, we thought. They flew away from Singapore, you know. That was about 100 years ago. Then, when the uh, conditions, our neighbours, the conditions in our neighbours' forests were not so good, they decided that, let's see what we can find in Singapore. So they flew to Ubin, and then they tried to set up a nest, they did, but we thought we'd help them along, so we then set up nest boxes. And we not only set up nest boxes, we set up smart nest boxes. Nest boxes. So which meant that we put a um, camera, bit of a voyeur, but anyway, we, yeah, the reason why we put them in is so that people can watch these hornbills without being too near them. And then we decided we'll make some even smarter uh, uh, nest boxes and we started putting weighing machines so, so we, we could actually measure how fast these little uh, hornbills were actually doing. So with modern technology, we learned a lot more about hornbills. But monitoring is extremely important because when the numbers become too big, then we realise that we should actually stop putting up nest boxes. So monitoring is extremely important. So science, and, and that's something that people like you and you and you can actually help out with citizen science. So um, those of you who are in, you know, you find them in Botanic Gardens, Changi, and, you know, Dempsey. Yeah. Uh, even if you're sitting down waiting for the bus out, outside Dobie Got MRT, you're likely to see hornbills. Yeah. And one time, uh, the ninth uh, International Hornbill Conference was held in Singapore, and people wondered why, because uh, uh, Professor Punswat was, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, selected Singapore. And that is because we managed to bring back the hornbills. So, we still find several different kind of species in insects. And insects are going to be the thriving ones. We have yet to know many of our insects. And when I was young, before many of you were born, in the 19, 1970s, there was this show called Hellstrom Chronicle. I don't know how many of you have seen it. If you haven't, then maybe you should Google and check whether YouTube has it. And this is a story of how, when all human dies, whatever, the insects will survive. But we can all do something about it. Um, and I think the important thing is everyone has to play a part. And playing a part in saying, yes, we can stop mass extinction of species because, as Peter said, it's for our own survival and it is within our willpower and our will to do it. Thank you. We're now at the point of questions and answers, and I'd ask uh, everybody to use one of the two microphones who wants to pose a question to any of the speakers to ask, to use one of the two microphones on either side, and please uh, identify yourself and the college you're in or the faculty that you're in when you ask a question, and, um, and try to ask one question 
to begin with because sometimes we get multiple ones, but we need a few people to start. I don't see anybody. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Kai Zhuo, year one, Dumbusu, economic student. So my question is for uh, Prof. Peter. Uh, we, can, we can all agree that conservation of species is important, maybe because it's morally right, or maybe because for a more pragmatic reason. However, what if conservation comes with a trade-off of human welfare or economic development? How can we prioritize conservation of animals over current human needs. For example, we, we can give a concrete example. Um, Ecuador found millions of barrels of oil underneath their rainforest, right? So if they drill the oil, they can get lots of money, but some species will die off. But Ecuador is also a developing country, which can use the money for um, improving infrastructure, providing food, education, whatever. So should we, how should we resolve this conflict between conservation and human needs? Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, let's take, take a question from here. Uh, hi, thank you for the... Yeah, thank on. you for the uh, very engaging uh, panel discussion. Um, I'm Ryan, I'm a pol political science student from Yuan, and uh, my question is actually open to the whole panel. So. Uh, we have who, talked sorry, a lot. Who, who are you asking the question? Uh, the whole panel. Whole panel. Whoever wants to answer. So um, we talked a lot about the conservation of species. So um, my question is, uh, are we doing it efficiently? Because a lot of resources are being thrown at uh, very cute animals who are indeed endangered, like the panda. But uh, they take forever to procreate and make new pandas. <laughs> so um, there are a lot of less cute animals out there. Maybe um, some insects, some birds. Do uh, you think that they should get more attention? we we'll take one more question, please. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Ryan, also a year one Paul Science student. Um, I would like to ask um, perhaps Miss Elaine. Um, the endangered species uh, are often found in rural areas and more often than not in less developed countries. Just as the argument for the restriction of carbon footprint amongst different states, how can we reconcile that? the unequal resources that poorer countries need to set aside. And the land and the resources is very different from what the developed countries, who are mostly um, urban cities, have to um, contribute. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. We've got three questions. So maybe I'll ask the panel to answer these three questions before we go on to another three questions. Elaine, you want to start? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. I think it's easier for me to tackle the last question since it's fresh in my head. So, um, sustainable development is key to balancing economic growth while we protect our natural resources, right? So, if you look at the rainforest, a lot of rainforests right now have been cleared for agriculture and paper, pulp and paper, as well as palm oil plantations. But if you look at the real value of rainforests, you know, according to the Economics of um, Ecosystems and Biodiversity Initiative, you have 99 million Indonesians who are dependent on the ecosystems within the rainforest. And they account for about 21% uh, of Indonesia's GDP. So if you, if you were to have to balance between growing monoculture agriculture and to maintaining the ecosystems in the state that they are in, the rainforest, you can actually yield a lot more in terms of uh, the benefits to both the communities living in that area as well as to the developed countries in which we are sourcing these uh, uh, com commodities. If you look at, for example, then the other side of things, the, the marine protected areas, right? we conserve about 20% to 30% of the seas and the oceans. Um, but if you look, look at the cost uh, uh, of it, it's only 5 billion to about 19 billion. But it helps to safeguard 70 billion to 80 billion worth of fish catches and the provision of the marine ecosystems value at 4.5 to 6.7 trillion annually. So I think it's not so much, we have so, so been so conditioned to think of uh, 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 nature conservation as being undermining economic and social development. But if you really weigh 
the cost of maintaining and preserving the ecosystems as it is, is going to use so much more than what we are accustomed to economically. I'm, I'm going to, un my answer is going to, you know, reply to several questions. Yeah. Uh, one of it, um, years ago, I went and stayed with the Penans, they are hunter-gatherers, and uh, we sort of posed a cheeky question on them and said that, you know, why don't we cut down all the forest, yeah, and then give you the money? You're going to be very rich. And the Penan replied, several of them, and said, no, we don't want your money because our supermarkets are all within the forest. You can't replace them. So they were not willing to. So um, when we start talking about you know, economics, sometimes we compare uh, monetary value, and it's very difficult. I have often been asked to defend, why are you conserving this marine area or whatever? Uh, when, if I reclaim it or do something to it, it's going to create so many jobs. But my answer is that it's very difficult for me to actually compare apples and oranges. But what I can say is that when you conserve, you actually, because we're thinking of future generations, if you destroy an ecosystem, there's no way you can replace it. But if you give that option of leaving, because you can find the next cure for cancer, the next cure for AIDS, the next cure for SARS, whatever, in those areas. So we should actually keep some of it as a kind of a security, you could say, an insurance for the young people. So you can't always put it in monetary terms. And we know that there are lots of ways, uh, you know, ecosystem services, put dollars and cents. Uh, there is this project called TEEP, the economics of you know, ecosystem and biodiversity. It's very difficult uh, to put everything in monetary terms. So there has got to be some kind of a value judgment, and which is why we've been promoting this idea of a biophilic city, biophilic ethos, because you've got to learn to love living organisms because our survival depends on it. Uh, Peter, please. Almost forgotten the first question. Trade-off trade trade between humans? Uh, this is Singapore. The one god we have in Singapore that cuts across everything is money. Right? In fact, as I'm told in many other countries I've been to, we all have the same god. Because we live in an economically globalized world. Right? Everything is connected. Money is the root of all evil, or the ultimate solution. Is there a conflict between conservation and economics? Of course there is, right? The problem with conservation is this. I've been in the field, in all sorts of places, talked to poor people, rich people, lectured by conservationists, lectured by all sorts of folks. You do not preach conservation to people which are starving, which are making a living out there. I've met people who shoot big animals and they are lectured by colleagues who say, do not shoot these big animals, they are cute, they are important, they are the top apex predators. And you see this guy, a family with three, four kids, all skinny, all right, and they're shooting the animals to cook so that their family can eat. What the hell do you say to them? Conserve the animals and starve to death? Practice sustainable farming. Cold reality on the ground is you do not, you are not able to practice real conservation if you do not solve the economic problems of the people. Let's be brutally blunt about this. Singapore is no different. 40, 50 years ago when Singapore became a country and economic problems challenged us to no end. Okay? Don't talk about conservation to the government. Don't even talk about conservation to my parents. I'll get scolded. Right? They have to make a living. Without making a living, they can't support the family. They will starve. Conservation can wait. <laughs> Today in Singapore, we are a first world country. First world, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've been told by some authorities that Singapore is not first world yet. 
effectively a first world country, we have the economic luxury of practicing conservation at the city level. We have the luxury to conduct conservation in maybe even other countries. That is a luxury of economic stability. To really push the conservation agenda, we have to have a strong economics beneath it. I'm not talking about making money quick, I'm talking about a sustainable economy that can keep people fed, taken care of, then they will worry about the next step. If you don't have a sustainable economy, you, don't, you can't take care of people, forget about conservation. It will not work. You will start a war, and it's a war that all of us will lose. In the context of conflict, that conflict is real. We have to come to a compromise between the two parties. The challenge for, as an ecologist and a biologist, my problem with dealing with economists, and some of you are economists here, is this, right? All of you want to make money. All of us, even me, I want to be rich, right? It's how fast you want to get rich. If you don't mind getting rich a bit slower, we can develop a sustainable economy. But if everybody wants to be a millionaire by the time they are 30, we are all in deep, deep trouble. Because somebody will have to pay for that speed. And chances are, it's the environment that will have to pay for the speed. So it's what we want. The compromise, we have to make. The question that's also asked by one of the folks here is very simple. How do we justify spending money on, or perhaps we should spend money on not so iconic animals, all right? Do I get very excited about the panda? Sorry, Elaine. Um, no. As a biologist, I can tell you one thing about the panda that will probably evoke no end of controversy. Right? The panda can become extinct. But we don't want it to become extinct. If you look at the fossil records of pandas, they have been declining over the last few million years because as bamboo forests contracted, pandas contracted in distribution. However, pandas are cute. They are beyond cute. They symbolize what conservation is about. Because if you let an animal like a panda die, right, it means that we have failed big time. Symbolic victories or symbolic, symbolic losses are just as important. In fact, I always joke with Prof Ko, if the panda becomes extinct, it'd be great for conservation. Every one of us would be so tortured, you know, ripped apart by our failure. Suddenly the world will go into another, you know, great excitement to save everything because the panda became extinct. We screwed up. Big time, sorry Elaine, your symbol becomes extinct. But the extinction of the panda may be a good moral boost. Because human beings live on tragedy. That is our tragedy, right? We are spending money on small animals. Uh, Lena made a pitch just now that uh, our national passport are trying to save my crab. No, actually a stupid crab which I described, I found 1986. Okay? When I named it and I thought it was new to Singapore, it was great fun because I found a species not found in Singapore before. Then it sat there for years and then over the years, as the world changed, people decided that these crabs need to be conserved. Why? Because it's only found in Singapore. So, if it becomes extinct, lao kui. Because it's embarrassing. A first world country cannot save an animal that's inside this national park. What on earth are you doing? It's disgraceful for the country. Is pride a good reason for conservation? Yes. Right? It's national pride we're talking about. All right? So, it is... People are trying to conserve animals of different sorts, from small things to big things. The challenge here is this. These animals are symbolic for the whole ecosystem. We choose a nice animal. The animal symbolizes the system that we want to conserve. Because, as Lena said, there are a lot of other animals inside there. Taxonomies are very slow. I need the systems conserved so that I can find out what's inside. That's the challenge we all face. We have to do a lot of give and take. I just wanted to add to uh, Professor Peter Ng's uh, statements. Before you all go home depressed that the panda is on the brink of extinction, it's not okay, it's on the rebound. <laughs> just to cheer everyone up. Um, <laughs> no, no, I say that's a problem because, uh, as one of you hinted, we do spend a disproportionate amount of money on these icons, right? Whether the money is well spent or not well spent, as one of you suggested, should the money be spent on a whole bunch of other animals, we're not sure. 
but one thing good about the pandas conservation is this. In China, it's become a powerful symbol for people to conserve whole forests, whole ecosystems, right. tigers, and all the other animals. Right. The panda is identified as the whole cause. All right? So, you know, it's like a Hollywood star, you need a symbol. The panda is the symbol. Yeah, sorry, Elaine. <laughs> so, if, you, if we look at what... Um, WDF focuses, right? We, there are iconic species we focus. There are also very important um, landscapes that we, we also aim to protect. And the reason we do that is not so much about saving that particular species, but it's the habitats and the interlocking relationship between that species with the whole ecosystems. And when you are able to preserve and, 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 and enable the particular species to be on the rebound, in a way, it also reflects on how well and how healthy the other parts of the ecosystems and other species within that habitats are doing. So for us, that's the strategy. I mean, it's basically identifying these species and these landscapes. And the landscapes which are likely to produce most of the commodities that the world needs. And that's where all our attention is for WWF. Let's take three more questions, please. Yes. yes. Good, evening. Yeah. Uh, good evening, speakers. My name is Liang Lea. Thank you for the very insightful presentation. Uh, I'm Ye Wan from Environmental Studies, and this question is addressed to uh, Ms. Elaine. Primarily to Ms. Elaine, but the rest can answer too. So I understand that WWF has the six focus areas. But I'm just wondering if there's any conflicts between them. So if I just take an example of the Cross Island Line, there are perspectives that say that if you improve the public transport system, you, Singapore can go more car light, it's probably good for climate change goals. But on the other hand, it's bad for the wildlife, the wildlife targets. So are there, really, are there actually such conflicts they face and how do you actually address them? Thank you. Did, did you get the question? Yeah. All right. Um, yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Benjamin, a year three business student. So um, after hearing this, uh, thank you for our discussion, by the way. I, I feel like I learned a lot. But something that is bothering me is that, you know, uh, we have mentioned previously there are five extinctions before this you know, proposed extinction. So my point is, to me, extinction seems a very natural and a very, it seems to be a very natural process. So for, I mean, to me, what is the point of stopping this extinction of species? I mean, I mean you might say that uh, conserving, so I'm a very pessimistic person also, so... <laughs> So uh, conserving, you know, uh, conserving animals is to help you know, future generation, biodiversity, etc., etc. But my point is that, what's the point? Like if humans go extinct, isn't it a very natural process also? So I, I don't really see the point of uh, mass, uh, conservation. So maybe someone can help me and like enlighten me and make me be a more optimistic person. That would be great. <laughs> I think you've been converted by Peter. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, please, and then I'll come to you also. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm Tang. I'm a life sciences major. And so my question actually is quite, um, it follows from his question because um, <laughs> uh, I recently had a discussion with my classmates and we were talking about how we think environmental education is really crucial. And we, we thought it would be ideal for all of us to have a baseline level of environmental education in our schools. But even if we were to start now, the effects will only, the effects will only kick in in a matter of decades when those gener that generation becomes in um, rich um, positions of power. And so in the meantime, how are, who is going to be responsible for environmental education for all the people in power who have, whose scale of impact is very large? And rather, instead of just who should be responsible, who might be in the best position to influence such people? Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, you, please. Hi, I'm Hui Ru from from your NUS. Um, my question is mainly directed to Prof Ng, but it would be great if the panel could answer the question too. Um, so Prof Ng mentioned that um, a country would want their economy to be sustainable before even thinking about um, environmental conservation. My question is, can an economy truly be sustainable if the environment is being degraded at um, quite an astounding rate, especially countries um, that are heavily dependent on natural resources for economic growth? And I guess part two to that question would be, um, is ecology and economics opposed to each other, or can they be realistically integrated in some way? Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. Good question. Um, we'll start with Peter this time. Always go 
always go backwards, but that's the question I remember best. This issue about uh, sustainable economy, the thing about having a sustainable economy and also good environmental care, those two are connected. You look at China right now. China is advocating to be the leader of the climate change world after the Americans are pulling back. All right? People say, oh, the Chinese are doing this because they just to make the Americans look bad. No. The Chinese are actually looking at the West and learning from all the not-so-nice things they did in the past to grow to where they are. The Americans and the Western countries, they reached their zenith of their economic growth. They are powerhouses today because they did a lot of not-so-nice things to their environment. And they are now paying the price for it. The Chinese are paying the price for it through bad air, bad water and all sorts of nasty things. The Chinese have realized, if I don't do something now, I'm going to have to pay for it later on. And the difference with the Chinese model from the American model is this. In the American model is, somebody else will pay later on, not my problem. In the Chinese communist system, they can't get away from it because they have to pay because they are the only party. <laughs> they have no other party to blame. The Chinese have realized this, and that's my interpretation, I'm not a political scientist, but my Chinese friends, when I ask them, why are you doing this, they say, common sense, what? Somebody has to pay, and I have to pay one of these days. So, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability in this modern age when we know things can go wrong are connected. One reason why Singapore has been so successful in greening every place and people want to do business here and Singaporeans are not neurotic or not too psychotic yet is because the living environment is pleasant. Lots of greenery, lots of trees, lots of birds. They make you feel good. Don't ask me why, right? When I see a lot of green, I see birds chirping, I see grasshoppers, crabs walking around, I feel good, right? It's human nature, all right? Biophilia, as Lena calls it. That is not a bad thing. Linked to the, perhaps one of the two questions on this side was, it's about cross island line and so on, about what the people can do now and for the future. The future has to start somewhere. The future must start now. The process of persuading young people to adopt this challenge is not an easy process and it will be a slow process, right? But what choice do you, have you got? In this modern age of democracy, you cannot tell people they must do this because they won't listen to you. My children hardly ever listen to me, right? They listen to their friends, they listen to their peers. Come on, all of you are young people, you know that, right? You learn from other people's experience. All these experiences take time to get into your system for you to want to believe, to want to do it. You have to be patient. There's no other choice. For you is to affect this generation, is for you to affect the next generation, and gradually, we will get progress. The ministers and the very powerful people like Prof. Tomiko, all right? I'll tell you honestly, I've spoken to a lot of the ministers and so on. They actually are aware of this, okay? Because Singapore, surprisingly, even though some of you may not believe it, we are a democracy. <laughs> the politicians must listen to you, all right? If you guys don't want greenery, you don't want the central reserves, don't want national parks, and you send a clear signal to the powers to be, get rid of Bukitima Nature Reserve, I want a condominium instead. Chances are they may listen to you. That's the power of democracy. It's because so many Singaporeans want a greener Singapore, want environmental sustainability, want conservation, and the government is moving in that direction also. You'd be surprised, right? So, it is actually very decisive. That's the good thing about democracy. I won't say the bad thing about democracy, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Lina, please. Uh. Okay. Um, <coughs> there are always a uh, conflict of interest. It's a matter of how you actually deal with it. Like, for example, we have um, dams to actually cope with water security, but that would mean that our um, river systems the uh, estuaries, gone. So we then have to take, you know, a uh, uh, um, measured approach now. How do we actually have both estuaries as well as water security? So those are some of the trade-offs, but if you take that into consideration and, do me and, and apply mitigation measures, we can quite often have the best of both worlds. 
So that's the you know, development process. But because we have the technology, and if you are aware and you make it a point to actually, okay, assess this, this is going to have this particular environmental damage, how do you actually mitigate it and make sure that you put it in place? Then you can be sure that whatever environmental impacts, you can actually mitigate to some way. Yeah. And then there was this other question about the five previous extinctions. You can't stop extinction. So what, what we are trying to say now is that we don't know what the next extinction is going to be like. It's like saying, you know, you keep seeing, you know, uh, white swans, white swans. When will you see a black swan? You might. And so with this, you don't know when the tipping point is. And it could be quite disastrous. So because of that, we have to be proactive and we see some decline and we see you know, more and more uh, species going because they are all interrelated. Um, therefore, it's important for us to try and do something proactive to stop extinctions. Now, um, there was this question about, you know, we can start educating the young. Uh, it would take another generation. Uh, how do you actually influence people in power? In 2011, you all know the results, right? It frightened PAP because the results was quite disastrous for them. They're so used to 70%, 80%, and then after that, they got about 50%, and some well-known petitions even lost seats. They're listening to you. As much as you say this pessimist here said, democracy does exist, you can speak. And what we have been trying to do now is to incorporate biodiversity conservation into the school curriculum. We've tried that with um, uh, schools, we've tried that with, with actually preschools. The universities are the toughest nut to crack. But anyway, we try, and that is why we need to get you involved in all sorts of programs. And we just, and, and it's not just formal education, but getting you all involved. There are many of the, the university students who are experts. There is NSYNC, Entomological Network of Singapore, actually run by you students. There's the um, uh, a reptile group, uh, herpetologist, young people from the university. I'm sure you look around, your classmates are all you know, mad about something or other creepy, crawly creatures. So you're all out there. The reason why we say educating the preschool is extremely important because if the young kids are enthusiastic about nature, they will drag their parents along. They say, we want to go out. We want to actually, you know, look at birds or whatever. So the parents have no choice but to actually, you know, bring them out. We have a citizen's program where we actually um, involve parents. So, um, and, and then of course, whenever we get a chance to talk, we invite, you know, politicians to our events so that they can see for themselves. Like, for example, did you see PM Lee, Facebook, um, uh, resting in a tire saw? Yeah. So just look, the politicians are aware and there are benefits to nature, not just greenies, but it's important for our health. It's important for us, for our psychological well-being. So it's not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, greenies um, grabbing. Yeah. And the last point, economic growth. Yeah. And why should we care about the environment? Because Lord Stern, he actually shook everybody up by saying that if you don't do anything cli for climate change now, you're going to pay the price much, much more when it actually happens you know, later. So therefore, there are actually strong economic reasons for caring for the environment, because if not, you're going to pay it uh, at some later uh, time and at a much, much higher price. So, so um, I think I've tried to, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Lena. Elaine? I, I, I think the, the balance between economic growth and conservation, they're not mutually exclusive. I think they are very mutually inclusive. And if you were to ask your parents how they feel about the price hike in water, I'm sure your parents be telling you, you know, how unhappy they are, blah, 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 right? But it's something that the government has to do because they realise that, look, you know, the water scarcity and, and, and food security are very real issues that's facing Singapore, 
And if, if, if they don't do this now, and for, for, for example, signing on and pledging to the Paris Agreement, um, we are a country that is so resource-starved. We import everything that we consume, almost 90%. If the world doesn't step up to combating climate change and, and, and embedding sustainable development into their, their, their government political and policy agenda, there uh, comes a time when, you know, and science has shown, right, there's a decline of uh, 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 the species populations and therefore it's going to impact the ecosystems. Everybody and every country is going to be guarding their own food and natural resources. And what's then going to happen to us? So that's the question that I think the government has taken very seriously and that's the reason why even WW has seen the government stepping up on, on a lot of these issues that we are trying to address globally. So I, 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 even when we work with corporations, we are no longer telling them, don't, don't, don't include environmental consciousness and, and your commitment to the environment as a corporate social responsibility. It should be very much part of your business policy and your way of doing business. And even for us in WWF, we work with financial institutions to ensure that financial institutions uh, uh, um, benchmark their, their lending policies towards environmentally, social and governance principles that when they lend to big conglomerates that are going to exploit the, the, the rainforest you know, for pulp and paper or for palm oil, that there is a set of criteria where they subscribe to in terms of regenerating the, the, the forest as well as being fair and equitable to the communities who depend on it. So it's a very holistic and very comprehensive approach that we need to take towards sustainable development. I think there's time for one more round of questions. Are there any students who want to ask questions? I start from this end. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Chris, uh, Year 2 Environmental Studies. And uh, my question is for Prof. N. Because uh, you mentioned about uh, the sustainability and I want to ask a question about sustainability instead of development. So, so I couldn't, couldn't hear you. Uh, sustainability in sustainable. city development. Because okay. uh, I want to bring a relevant example, which is Hong Kong. So both Hong Kong and Singapore have 100% uh, urban population, but Hong Kong is so densely populated, so it has conserved a huge part of natural landscapes. So according to a uh, ecological perspective, uh, which model do you think is more sustainable? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Are you from Hong Kong? No. no. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Lavon. I'm a year two Southeast Asian Studies major. So um, in light of all the, the, the frantic chase of like, you know, environmental conservation and everything, there have been huge concerts, to no, to no offense, um, huge concerts and huge marathons, huge campaigns to promote environmental conservation. But at the same time, these concerts or these events, they are just people going there to chase a few good factor and they generate a lot of waste at the end of the day. So have we commodified conservation? And is this necessarily a bad thing? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, what, last question. Hi, I'm Ruben, a geography major. Um, my question is uh, shifting away from policy, but so what can we do as individuals on a day-to-day -day basis which would have the most impact on uh, the environment, like in a good way? Yep, this question is directed to the whole panel. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, maybe we begin with, um, with Lina this time. Lina, because there's a question about what? Sustainable, sustainability in city development. Yes. And, and if you care to make some... Comparison between Hong Kong and sure. Singapore. Yeah, um, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd love actually to always compare Hong Kong and Singapore or Hong Kong and Penang because uh, we're always trying to look for islands that we can compare like to like. Um, yes, Hong Kong has very high uh, population density, but note too, Hong Kong is a lot of hilly land. So which means that you can't develop anyway in those areas, therefore they might as well conserve it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's so flat in, 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 in Singapore. I mean, the highest, uh, uh, you know, gnaw little knob here is Bukit Timah. 
So, so that, that there's really no comparison. So, um, um, yes, in, in that sense, uh, Hong Kong has that different approach that they have very, very dense uh, uh, um, population, everybody housed in a small area, and then they leave the rest which they cannot develop. In, in Singapore, the approach is different in the sense that we conserve as many of the different ecosystems as possible so that we have a diversity of ecosystems. But our, the, the difficulty is when there's flat land, it makes it harder actually to justify. So we've, we try very hard to actually fight for it. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, but for every city, we have to approach it uh, slightly differently, and which is why, uh, as Prof Ko said, uh, we work with the Convention on Biological Diversity in partnership with um, um, you know, cities around the world and actually uh, sub-national governments to actually come up with uh, the, the, uh, uh, an index, and it's called the Singapore Index on Cities Biodiversity, to actually um, uh, allow city to do, uh, have a self-assessment tool, uh, measure how well are they doing. They're not, they're not, uh, we don't want them to actually look at their neighbours and see how well the neighbour is doing, but how well are they doing. A uh, 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 comparison with themselves, like let's say uh, five years ago, are we any better off or not? So, so that's a, you, you can Google and, and check for that uh, index if you want to actually see what you can do to help your city be more green or biodiversity. So, when it comes to concerts commodifying uh, conservation, um, I, I think we. We have events, I'm not talking about concerts, but um, MPALS does hold events, but our events are usually related to you know, uh, direct conservation in the sense that you know, can you do something about like tree planting or you know, uh, 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 do bio blitz, we're really into bio blitz these days so that uh, people can come and learn more about the biodiversity. I think that's extremely important. And it also adds an element of citizen science. And the last, what can we do on a day-to-day -day basis it's quite interesting because um, at one time, uh, we all know how many portions of fruits, how many portions of vegetables we need to eat every day in order to measure to be healthy. So you ask yourself, how much of biodiversity do you need to keep you healthy every day? So um, Professor Tim Beatley, who wrote the book Biophilic Cities, then said, based on the Singapore model, he came up with this food pyramid so that how much you, you know, need. And I, in fact, I wrote a blog in the Nature of Cities, and, and you can just Google for it, where I talked about how, what dosage of greenery do you need? Like, if you have, you can see greenery every day that helps you, you know, then, then when you see greenery every day, you want to do something about making your environment green. And, and in Singapore, it's, it's just quite amazing how it actually ramifies. Like for example, do you know that we have two hospitals that are really truly biophilic hospitals? One is Kutik Wat, and the other one is Ng Teng Fong. And every window in Kutik Wat Hospital faces greenery, every window. And every level in, in, in Teng Fong Hospital, in right smack in very, very built up Jurong, has a little island of greenery at every level so that people can actually enjoy the greenery. So for you, if you feel that, you know, there are lots of things you can do. You can volunteer, you can do tree planting, you can actually uh, uh, help out with guided walks, you could actually do gardening, you can uh, lead you know, uh, there, there are tons of things you can do. Just contact us and we'll find you something to do to help make the world greener. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, Lina. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, could you, um, could you also um, close with some inspirational thought for our students? Okay. What, what <laughs> I'll, is, what I'll is try. The, what is the takeaway <laughs> you want them to go home with? Okay. And so, Peter, I'll come to you last. Could you do the same? So let me just answer the question about um, whether we are commodifying conservation. Um, we just ran the Earth Hour event, which we run every year, and Earth Hour is into its 10th anniversary, right? 
So that question has been posed to us many, many times. Why do we do such a massive event? You know, there's so much energy resource uh, being, 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 being sapped and uh, uh, why do we do this at all? How many of you here are concerned about the environment? Can I just see by a show of hands? Okay, so I'm almost speaking to the choir, right? So, so if you look at Earth Hour, it's really trying to draw in the 80% who are either sitting on the fence and who don't care about the environment or conservation. And that's why we run Earth Hour. It is to, 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 to send a message that the world does care and we need to care about the environment. And it's to reach out to that 80% who otherwise would not come for an event like this. Right? From there, you start that whole awareness building. So is it a journey for us? Yes. Once you come and you become a little bit more aware, we try and take you on towards a journey where you then become a more conscious consumer and a more conscious citizen. So at this particular Earth Hour, we were very glad to be able to partner with the organizers of Sundown Marathon because it meant being able to have a captive audience of 30,000 participants as compared to having an Earth Hour event where we just had five to 6,000 people. So it's being able to then be there to show our stand for the environment uh, and, 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 and speaking you know, about our concern for the environment with a completely new audience. And for the first time, we were also able to run a carbon neutral marathon, which means we had carbon offsetting for everybody who participated in the marathon. So that to us is the start of embedding sustainable development into our daily lives, right? So this is how we see it. It's really, really about trying to push out the message, not to the choir, but to the rest of the populations who are so vital in making that, 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 that change. Um, Prof asked me to leave with some words, right, of inspiration. You are the generation that's going to change the tide, okay, of climate change. Probably not in my lifetime, but you have the opportunity right now. So pick a course, learn as much as you can, and be an opinion leader. Because we have seen how environmental policies and issues have been addressed and changed because of people like you who stand up for it, who are willing to speak and advocate and champion for it. Thirdly, be a conscious consumer. Right? In this very convenient, focused society, make choices that are planet-friendly. Lastly, come onto our website, come into other environmental NGOs, you know, like what they do, share as much as, as possible because social media is the new uh, uh, media outreach, right? That we can, we can at, the, at, at, the, at the press of a button, reach hundreds and millions of people. So you are the generation that's going to be able to change uh, 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 climate change and for the better. And at a, at a rate that's even uh, faster than the way in which we are losing right now our species. Thank you, Philene. Uh, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Inspiration measured. Okay. The questions in reverse order. I've got good friends in Hong Kong. My mother was from Hong Kong. I've got relatives in Hong Kong. I like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very uh, free and easy place, all right? The people down there are very good at doing business, all right? The difference between Hong Kong and Singapore and why conservation is different, it's very simple. Hong Kong's history started as a trading port. When it was administered by the British, its primary mission was to make money for the crown. Simple. The people, they're just digits. They're there to help with the economic prowess of the queen. Simple. Hong Kong progressed through the decades. The people were secondary. Making money was the only thing that's important. Singapore, when we became independent in 65, the government made a conscious effort at that time, and it was controversial. Our PM wanted cheap public housing. He realized very, very clearly at the beginning at that time, I need to put all you guys, or your parents, or your parents' parents, into houses they can call their own. Once that stability, is ensured because there's a house over your head that you can call your own. Next step, economic development. Next step, growth. Hong Kong did not progress through those logical steps. 
when Hong Kong became sort of back to China and so on, you have a huge number of people down there that didn't have the ability to own homes because the government did not actually plan for that on a large scale. I've got relatives there. They complain because they can't buy a house with their salary that they have. Too many people squeezed in one tiny room. They rent. The rents are exorbitant. It's not a surprise that the richest people in Hong Kong are all property magnates. Yeah. That's the core reality of Hong Kong. Housing for the people was compromised. Conservation becomes easier because all the hills, who say you cannot build on hills? Of course we can build on hills if you spend the money and the effort at the beginning. But now, there are just too many people to house in too short a time. That's one reason why they changed chief executive in the middle, right? That's a challenge for Hong Kong. Are there more green areas in Hong Kong? Yes. But it's a different sort of problems. It's not comparable, all right? Our histories are not the same. It's always nice to compare Hong Kong and Singapore because both countries, highly dense, full of people, all right? And challenges galore. But the challenges are different because we have an advantage. And fortunately, we plan ahead. Commodification and environment. Please tell me, what in Singapore is not commodified? Your whole education system is commodified to some degree or the other. Right? Everything we do in life these days is commodified in one form or the other. But before you get too depressed, <laughs> commodification of the environment is something you can turn on its head to your advantage. Elaine did say one thing. Many companies are realizing the power or the use of the economy, of environment and the economy. 20 years ago, you tell, talk to companies about environment, they'll laugh at you, say, I cannot make money, do for what? More and more companies now are realizing people, especially in first world countries, want environmentally friendly things. You are prepared to pay for it. You are prepared to look for it. You go to a tourist resort somewhere overseas in nearby countries. You don't want to go to one that kills animals for fun, you know, chops up turtles and presents to you for food. You will go to one which is environmentally, environmentally sensitive. You check your blogs. You are the consumer and market forces. Commodification is something you can use to the environment's advantage. More and more companies are moving towards it, not because they are green at heart, maybe they are, but they realize the economic value of being green. Every year we complain about all that wonderful, you know, stuff that comes in September? You know, those wonderful particles that come over? <laughs> and I talk to a lot of students every time I go for meetings like this, and then they say, oh, what can we do about it? Nothing. We can do absolutely nothing until you guys and all our neighbors in Malaysia and so on are willing to do something. And what is that? Punish. Those guys which are burning, how do you punish them? Economic forces. You choose what are the products you want. If you think company A, B, C are responsible, boycott all their goods. They will feel the pain and they can't sue you because there are too many of you to sue. In a few years, you don't have to chase them about burning. They will regulate themselves. Hit them where it hurts the most. Market forces. It's a very powerful tool. Market forces used correctly by environmentally sensitive people is arguably the most powerful tool you guys will have to deal with the challenges we have. Species extinctions, climate change, pollution. That's where you hit them. All right? A friend of mine in economics said, Peter, that is called environmental terrorism. <laughs> well, terrorism and freedom fighters are two different sides of the sphere. All right? Last thing to fulfill what Prof. Ko asked me to do, is to give you something inspirational. I'm not very good at inspirational, okay? I'm very good at being pessimistic. You must believe what you're doing. For those of you who think you're doing something important right now because it feels good, very good. The environmental challenges that you are facing will not be won in one generation. Even if all of you advocate strongly, do the right thing, and you actually manage to slow down climate change. Even you can persuade Mr. Trump to change his climate change policies. Even if you succeed tomorrow. Xi Jinping is meeting President Trump, right, tomorrow? Thursday and Friday. Thursday and Friday. Even if Mr. Xi can change Mr. Trump's mind, 
that is a temporary victory because the challenges you face to hold your environment in a livable state is what I tell my students. This is a forever war. It has been sustained generation after generation after generation because all it needs is one generation to screw up and then we start all over again. <laughs> Which means that you folks have a challenge, not just advocating for yourself, persuading your parents to cooperate. Many of the older people are very stubborn. Persuading your friends to cooperate because your friends will listen to you. And for you, your children and the peers that you will teach. The message you send to them will affect them. They will listen, right? One of the nicest way things I ever did in over the years, and I don't do many nice things, I kill for a living, right? Is I persuaded a lot of young children, you know, primary school kids, that eating shark's fin is bad. Then embarrassing their parents after that. And a few parents say, Peter, that is a low-down, underhanded trick. Right? I say, but it worked, right? So now, gradually, after a while, they don't eat shark's fin. Is it terrorism? No. <laughs> Then what do you call it, sir? Moral suasion. What? Moral suasion. Moral suasion. That's the passing <laughs> message I had. All right. On that note, I bring this to a close. Thank you all very much.